Thank you. Thank you for that very kind introduction and uh, for the opportunity actually to join you at the event. Good evening from New York, but certainly good morning and good afternoon or wherever you may be joining this forum. It's a real pleasure to be able to be with you today and, and just greet all of the members who are at this special event. You know, I took some time to go online and, and look at some of the pictures and it certainly does look very exciting, very energizing and lots of lots of talk and mention going on about the key issues that you've been discussing. So it's great to be with you here today. And the session, as the moderator said, you know, looking at ambitious business action for the sustainable development goals could hardly be more relevant at this point in time. You know, for once in, 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 in recent history, the entire focus of the world has shifted to that of the pandemic, be the political, the health, the economic, or the social aspects of it, and towards finding responses, both short and long-term. And within the UN, and of course, within the UN Global Compact, the organization that I lead, we've echoed the fact that business ambition and the sustainable development goals provide a path to guide through the COVID response and the COVID recovery. And then more importantly, that recovery should result in equitable, inclusive and sustainable outcomes. And we mustn't forget that before the pandemic, the world was facing twin crises of climate change and inequality. And some of those challenges I know are very close to home for many of you who are gathered here today. And so to achieve this green and inclusive recovery from COVID-19, we do need to scale up the business ambition on both the sustainable development goals and the Paris Climate Agreement. And we need to match it with meaningful, measurable and urgent business action. And that's exactly what the UN Global Compact Strategic Plan for the next three years challenge us to do, and therefore challenges the local network in Australia and subsequent businesses. A bit about myself, I, I come from the private sector, as, as Paul does the previous speaker, and I, I fully understand how every business must constantly evaluate and adjust its operations to deliver results. Otherwise, it just wouldn't make sense to be in business. And the same holds true for the UN Global Compact and our local networks and signatories, including yourselves in Australia. And for the Global Compact, our founding mission still rings strong. We aim to give a human face to the global market. But our new strategy calls for a, a, a series of key shifts to amplify this, to accelerate business action, and to provide a framework for the global business community to meet this historic moment. It's an unshakable commitment to the values of business responsibility, sustainability and cooperation now more than ever. I commend all of you for helping Australia avert the terrible hardships that have gone through this COVID period and that so many other countries have suffered and continue to suffer. And indeed, it is my hope that in the near future, we will all have equitable access to vaccines and, and treatment for all and real opportunities for economic generation and recovery that is equitable, inclusive, and sustainable. But I also do hope that the types of partnerships, the ambition and the scale that we've seen within the private sector, but also across the public and private sectors over this last year, continue, and not only to address emergency issues, but to address the very important sustainable development issues. Because no one business, no singular sector, can truly solve today's global problems because they're complex, they're multidimensional and they're full of challenges. And so partnerships are key. But I have extreme confidence in the private sector's capacity to contribute to such an inclusive recovery, stemming from my own experience, as well as the realm of corporate sustainability. You know, in that spirit, you know, when I joined the Global Compact last year, I came with a strong sense of purpose and commitment, understanding the risk that many visionary businesses and certainly businesses like yourselves must have to take as you move to mainstream sustainability practices. And the UN Global Compact is in the business of helping leaders unleash companies' vast potential to do that and more. Ourselves and the local network in Australia are certainly collaborating with businesses to set new standards of sustainability in their operations and through their supply chains. And we're convening conversations like this one today to develop new corporate norms of business responsibility and of transparency to evaluate and to address the social impacts of business and to align business practices with the sustainable development goals and the Paris Agreement on Climate. These conversations are critical for generating the business ambition and the action needed to tackle the climate crisis and leave nobody behind. In other words, to make these global sustainable development goals local business. 
At a recently held Financing for Development Forum last month, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres called for a huge paradigm shift to fully align the private sector with the Sustainable Development Goals. And the shift is truly a response to the systemic inequalities and failures exposed by the pandemic. And Australia must certainly be part of this. If I move forward to really look at, at climate and an issue that brings us together, the European Union has pledged to become the first carbon neutral bloc by 2050 and has aligned its COVID-19 recovery package with that objective. Another 110 countries, including the UK, Japan and the Republic of Korea, have also made commitments to net zero emissions by 2050. China is aiming for 2060. To really underscore the issue of ambition and urgency, these commitments send signals of a new modus operandi. However, there remains a big difference between promises, financial commitments, firm action, and actual impact. And as we prepare for the COP26 climate conference in November, we cannot afford to hit pause on private sector action. Science tells us that decarbonation is at the core of effective net zero strategies. And it's also the foundation of our campaign on business ambition for 1.5 degrees Celsius, which the UN Global Compact has launched together with our partners at the Science-Based Targets Initiative. Our goal, it's simple, but yet it's very complex to get companies involved in averting the worst impacts of climate change, which will certainly occur unless the rise in global temperature is limited to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. Now, when we launched this campaign in 2019, we knew it would take some time to form a critical mass of companies setting these science-based targets, not only for them to impact their direct greenhouse emissions, but also indirect emissions. But now, more than 500 businesses, many of them key players in the market, have signed up and stepped up their ambitions to reduce emissions across the board. And today, again, reflecting on urgency and ambition, we can see a pathway to 1.5 degrees future. But to bring that much closer to reality and to success, we need to expand the campaign from hundreds to thousands. So far, I'm told 29 major Australian companies have committed to set emissions reduction targets through the Science-Based Targets Initiative. 12 of these have had their targets validated, and I urge every company present to join this effort by signing on to business ambition for 1.5 degrees. Through this wider movement, I believe we continue to demonstrate ambition and urgency and hope to reach the target of net zero emissions globally by 2050. For climate and for all other critical areas, we must mobilize businesses at every level, in every sector, to innovate new solutions that will benefit people, the planet, and ultimately the bottom line. And allow me to quote the UN Secretary General again. He says, many businesses are choosing a net zero future both because we have no alternative, but also because they recognize the immense business opportunities that are there to be seized. So in Australia and around the world, again, reflecting on ambition and urgency, I hope that we take the challenge to build forward from the current crisis. Business will be a key part of that recovery. So I call on all businesses, those who have not yet seized the opportunity and the time to do so. It's important to support business as business reinvents as business transforms supply chains into engines of sustainable development, and certainly as business models build businesses in which purpose, principles, and profit go hand in hand. So thank you very much for your kind attention. I hope to continue this conversation on making the sustainable development goals relevant for business in Australia, Asia, the Pacific, and beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sandra. That was amazing, and, and thank you for joining us. Um, if I may, you mentioned your experiences in the private sector at the very beginning with, I think, Safaricom in, in Kenya. In the spirit of helping local businesses uh, around the world, what were some of those sustainable business practices that have stayed in your mind over the years that you might be able to share with us? Great, thank you. And thanks for taking me back to, to my past. So as you mentioned, I did work with Safaricom. It's a mobile operator, actually part of the Vodafone family. For some of you might recognize Vodafone Australia. Safaricom is the, the Kenyan affiliate of that. And while there, I headed up and actually started off the sustainable business practice for the company. Uh, 10 years in also, we also became a UN Global Compact member. So I can again attest even from the outside, the value of the work that the UN Global Compact brings to sustainable businesses. But, but to your question, you know, let me highlight some things that are key around sustainable business. 
I think first business purpose is critical. You know, a purposeful business gives you a long term view to business and understanding the opportunities much bigger than profitability. And I alluded to that in my speech. So business purpose is, is critical. You know, you've got to be able to take what I call a, a, a broad stakeholder view, not just a shareholder view to the way that you do business. Doing that will allow you to take into consideration, certainly, of course, your investors, but customers, society, the future generation, industry, industry impacts. And I think that is really important. You know, one of my biggest lessons, what I have to say, is it starts at the top. This starts with the board. It starts with the CEO. You know, you've got to be able to have that leadership buy-in and that leadership commitment. Uh, embracing sustainable business, again, is not something that is done in a siloed way, in a singular department, in a feel-good way. It's really about, you know, embracing corporate strategy and corporate structure around this very important work. And I think, again, you know, finally to cap it off, you've got to report on this in the same way that you report on other important business metrics, because after all, it is core to your key business strategy. Thank you, Sandra. From purpose to reporting, I think that's, there's some really good experiences there. Um, if I may just sneak in one, one last question. Um, I am I'm a self-confessed supply chain nerd, as well as being an, an electric vehicle nerd. Um, I know many of the people in the room and many of the people online are working more closely than ever before with their supply chains on environmental and social and, and economic risk resilience issues. From your global viewpoint, what are some of the best ways that organizations can work with their suppliers to, and I'm, your, the words from, from uh, what you were saying this morning, to transfer their supply chains into en engines for sustainable development? Very important question. And then always great to meet a supply chain nerd because supply chains make the world go round. I think we saw this in COVID, you know, when supply chains were broken a lot of products, services, people just simply got stuck. So supply chains are important. I think that the best practice to be able to transform these supply chains into engines of sustainable development is first, a business has to recognize that you're probably only as strong or as weak as your supply chain is. Businesses that built resilient supply chains thrived. Businesses that had weak supply chains did not survive. And I think that's very important. So how do you build that resilience? I think first is really to, to, to ask yourself the question is, you know, what does your supply chain do for you? It's not simply a funnel for inputs and outputs. You've got to look at whether or not your supply chains are inclusive, whether they're sustainable, whether they're opportunities that expand your footprint into expansion, which is great, provide you access to markets or inputs, great, provide you opportunity to innovate, fantastic. But you've got to recognize that your business and your supply chains are also the same conduits for negative or positive impact on climate and the environment. You know, the channels where labor rights can be exploited, where human rights can be exploited, where children get dragged into to work when they should be at school or with their friends, where corruption thrives. So I think, you know, you've got to have a very key mission and vision alignment. What, is, what your business stands for is what your supply chain must stand for. That's very important. I often encourage businesses to do supplier self-assessments, you know, in the spirit of reporting, assess and lay the issues on the table. Is this working? Is it not? Be transparent. How do we sell, uh, support our supply chains to address these key issues? Tools, resources, collaborative work has got to be key. But I think more importantly, you've got to realize that your supply chain is a fundamental part of the way that you do business yourself as a corporate entity. Couldn't agree more. Uh, Sandra, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you're only as strong as your supply chain, I think, is a, is a really important message. Um, thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you for those inspiring words. Would you uh, all join me in thanking Sandra very much?